All right, you guys. So it is your boy Ticket Man. Y'all already know what it is, man. Shouts out to the Lions Den basketball community, man. Salute to my brother Eight Weapons. He rep midlife music. You can go to tickettvmedia.com. Get the music, the merch. Also, y'all make sure y'all go check out this brother channel right here, man. Kwame Brown Bus Life. Man, y'all already know what it is, man. And y'all know how we getting down, man. And we told y'all we was gonna come back. And hit y'all in y'all head with this episode. This right here is gonna be the most anticipated because this this right here is gonna clear up a lot of things that people have tried to characterize and put on you, false allegations that people have tried to put out about you. And this is a chance that I think that I don't think I never heard you like just really have a, just a chance an interview where you just cleared the air on that whole situation. So I really want to get deep into this. Because I think this is gonna be one of the best. This probably this probably gonna be one of the top interviews in 2024 too. I know Shannon Sharp did his, and that's gonna that's just another level what he's doing. But yeah. I think this right here, because you were one of the originators who came on YouTube and broke the internet like nobody seen before until the Shannon Sharp stuff just happened. Nobody saw anybody break the internet like you did, dog. And then all these little uh, uh, sideways attacks came from people that you didn't even know. People trying to right. put stuff with your name that they wasn't there. And I'm always a person like this. Was you there? So when right. people talk about what, oh, Michael Jordan and stuff did, shout out to Michael Jordan. You know, greatest player of all time, in my opinion. But when they try to put stuff on his name and say that these things happen to you, bro, and lie and, and put all these, bro, we're going to clean this up. So I want to start tonight, bro, by I want to start from the beginning when you got drafted so you coming out of uh high school bro yeah what made you what was the what was the, the thing that said that you know what i don't want to go to college i want to go to the nba uh playing against eddie curry and tyson chandler um i was a student of the game i knew about tyson chandler since uh maybe the eighth grade and so I'm, I'm chasing them to different tournaments. I'm jumping on different AAU teams to try to catch him. Um, and Eddie Curry, I ended up being cool with him. Him, and his, his mother and my mother really took a liking to each other. Um, so we, we kind of uh, made a bond like that. But uh, far as a basketball standpoint, I'm chasing those two guys because those were the names that I kept hearing um, in high school. Tyson Chandler has such a big name in high school or middle school. And it was crazy. So just from a competitive standpoint, uh, when I faced those two gentlemen and they said that they were going number one, I'm like, what? So at that moment, I said, well, if they going to go number one, and I started telling people I'm going number one because I killed them two dudes. So that's really what made you say, you know what, I'm, go I'm going to the league instead of going to high school. I mean, going to college. Yep. Now, at this time, what were you being advised to do by scouts, maybe agents, whatever? What were you being advised to do? I was insulated from new people. I think everyone, once everybody around me knew what it was, like my family was kind of too overprotective. But um, so I wasn't being advised by a lot of people. Um, once I talked to Billy Donovan and once I talked to my mentor, they're like, look, if your ultimate goal is to make it to the NBA and you're projected to go number one, then what's better than number one? But of course, I know Billy wanted me to get a year or two of college because he felt like it would help develop uh, because he didn't think the NBA developed players. Um, but, you know, when I, I've been playing against grownups my whole life. Right. Okay. So, okay. I, I feel you're saying now. So, uh, did you end up, did you uh, work out for any NBA teams or did you just enter your name in the draft? And how did you find out, like, how did you find out that you were, that they were projecting that you were going to go number one? Um, Just the agent. I, um, I hired Aaron Tellum. And Aaron Tellum, at first he told me, you're one to three. Uh, one through three, because uh, three, they thought that maybe they would go with Shane Battier um, because he went to Duke. Um and, you know, they, he had won a couple of championships. Um, but once we started working out, uh, it, it wasn't even close. We used to call Shane Battier, Round Hill Battier. Like, uh, his, 
he would just take charges all the time, and that they wasn't there to see that. They was there right. to see you compete. Mm hmm. So now you 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 don't know if you're gonna go number one for sure. Is that that's what you're saying? By the by the first workout, by the first NBA workout, I knew. Oh, so you knew you was going number one. So do you know the Wizards were gonna take you? Period. Yeah, they they brought us in a second time because uh, MJ really liked Tyson Chandler um, because Tyson Chandler, like I said, nobody knew who I was. Um, I came out of nowhere. I didn't go to a big school. Nobody know where Brunswick is at. It's just when I got to the arena, whoever the name you came to look at, I said, I'm going to make them see me. And so wherever I was, they came to see Eddie Curry. They came to see uh, David Lee. But they like, who the hell is that? And so that's how I kept it. And so when uh, MJ felt like uh, he would have drafted Tyson Chandler, it would have been easier to trade him to uh, to get Elton Brand. Okay, I see what you're saying. So yo, and you when you went to the workouts, what was your interaction with Jordan pre, pre-draft? A lot of trash talking. I was trying to play him one-on-one. You know, I was oh, so he's. He's out there then. He was out there with you then. Oh, yeah. He's out there. He's out there joking and watching. And, you know, a lot of people was intimidated by him. You know what I mean? You see, that's Michael Jordan. And me, I was more so like, what's up? Let's play. And uh, I don't know. He, he thought I was a little cocky a little bit. But I just wanted to play him. You know, you meet your idol. You, you know, if you think you can sing, you won't want to sing against somebody. If you think you can hoop, you're going to want to hoop against him. That, I thought that was normal. Did they, so they, okay, let's get to this. So when they drafted you, or when they said they was going to take you number one, did mm-hmm. they tell you that they had a plan for you? With that, how they wanted to use you, a plan for you, and how they envisioned you in the in that organization? I don't think they knew what the hell they was doing. <laughs> I think uh, they had a plan of MJ coming back the whole time. Uh, and then, Oh, so MJ wasn't officially back at this time yet? Yeah, no. Nah. Because they didn't have a plan for me at all. It was just like, I, they didn't even know if they wanted to play me at the three, uh, the four, or the five. So they just put me out there. They ran a couple of plays. They tried me at the three. Then they they put moved me to the four after they put about 25 pounds, 30 pounds on me. And then it was like, no, nah, that's too heavy. And they made me sit out to lose all this weight. So I'm like, and then MJ announced that he was coming back. So I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, so after the draft, in between then and the season starting, that's when MJ announced all coming back. Right around, right around, right after preseason, he announced. Okay, but they kind of had an idea he may do that from when you mm-hmm. got drafted. All the, so okay, I see. What you, now it makes sense. Mm-hmm. So that's why they probably didn't really know what type of plan they was gonna have. Because in the back of their mind, they're thinking if MJ come back, we can't really tell Kwame that we're gonna invest and put the whole franchise in you because normally. And this is the thing I think that people always misunderstand, bro. And I kind of mm-hmm. I slipped on this too in the past thinking, bro. Normally, when you a number one overall pick, they giving you the franchise because you going to a team that's not a good team, and mm-hmm. they giving you the franchise. They're gonna put the ball in your hands, and they're gonna ride and die with you those first few years. They're gonna put it the franchise in your hands to build around you. So, yep. but your situation was unique and different because you have the greatest player of all time coming back to the league for a third time and now it's like well damn it could have been a situation where we invested in this young guy and we're gonna build through him but now it's jordan back so now everything got to go to the back burner is that pretty much how it is how you you pretty much (laughs) saw it as it happened that's exactly what happened it went from they went from treating me like a brand new Benz to you know what's up probably you the number one draft pick to who are you (laughs) like Nigga, MJ back. You know what I mean? It went from no media. It was so crazy. It went from barely any media in the locker rooms. Uh, and then when it started picking up the rumors that he may come back, and then when he announced it, you would have thought it was like the president came back. You know, the Washington Wizards went like 19 and like 50-something or 60-something uh, that last season. Mm-hmm. They only won 19 games. Let me ask you something. Why do you think Jordan decided to come back? I think he just wanted his last hoorah. I think he was trying to prove something to himself. Um, 
And MJ is not the type of guy that's going to go out without trying. You know what I mean? He's going to, he's going to, you have to prove it and prove him wrong. And even now to this day, he probably still not satisfied. He's still probably thinking, what if I could have got Elton Brand? Cause you know, he liked to play with veterans. He liked who he liked. Um, he don't want, he didn't want any other coach, but Doug Collins cause he knew or either Phil Jackson, but uh, he couldn't get Phil. So he went back to Doug, a guy that allowed him to just, you know, do what he do. Now, <clears throat> so you get drafted. <clears throat> they didn't have a plan for you, which most 90% of teams, you draft the guy number one overall, we got a plan for you. Only a few times when you go in a situation like you went into or you go in a situation like the boy James Wiseman went into where he went into where he went into a world championship team that just had a bad season because everybody was hurt and they end up getting the top pick. So now they get you, but you ain't fit to get that ball because you're still with Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, all the other boys over there when they come back healthy. So now you thrown to the back burner. You're not being used like a number one overall pick. A lot mm -hmm. of people, a lot of us didn't understand that and didn't yeah. look at it like that. And I think that, I think that people got to, in hindsight, look at it like this. And, it's, and especially, I told you, when you got guys like Stephen A. Snitch that come out here and that push a narrative your whole career and ain't basically breaking down factual information. Now, I think that that's why it's important. Because you didn't say nothing the whole time, you just you you just mind your own. So if one person's attacking you and nobody else saying something, most people are gonna go with this dude that's attacking you because they ain't even getting your side to even understand where you're coming from because you didn't talk. So now you look at this situation. After you got drafted, when did you start going over? Because you you play, I think you play summer league. When did you go? When did you go over to the? When did you report to the Wizards after you got drafted? Uh, I went. I went early, so I went. Uh, shoot, first of September, maybe September first. I was there. And what did they have you doing from day one when you got over there? Man, I'm working out two times a day. <laughs> they uh, meal prepping. They were going over meal prepping, but just basically, um, at first they played me. They were working me at the three, and then it was like, okay, he don't have a deep enough shot. We we need him to hit threes. So they said, we got to bulk them up to put them into the four. So I'm pretty much lifting twice a day, just trying to bulk up and gain some weight. Okay, so you did that. How long did you go through? And then you went through that routine until summer league, right? Mm-hmm. So when you got to summer league, uh, was uh, was Jordan coming in the gym at this time when you was in there working out? Yeah, he, he's, he's at every game. He's just sitting in the stand watching the game, but – um, we would all see him working out. No, no, I'm talking about I'm talking about in the practices. I'm talking about when you reported yeah. early. I'm saying when you reported early, Jordan was Jordan was there in the gym. Yeah, he was in every practice. So no, no, I'm saying no. Oh, so no, you was practicing when you reported early. Yeah, they had guys in there. They would bring in uh, guys from uh, college. They would bring in guys from, from the University of ah, Maryland, okay, okay, Georgetown. Yeah, they, and okay. they always had some former players that's in D.C. So it was always people there to play. So he would be, they would work us out in the morning and then let us let us go up and down in the afternoon. What was your interaction with Jordan at this particular time when you had reported early and you were in there working out and doing it? What was your interaction with him on a daily basis? I mean, it was cool. I mean, he just, he a, he a jokester. So he would more just rank on you and make a couple jokes. And, and that was about it. Like he, he pretty much a normal, regular dude. So it was, it was easy to deal with him. It wasn't until he came back to where he turned into, he turned into something else when he started playing. We, we gonna get to that now. <laughs> at this time, at this time, when you had went and reported, was Jordan slapping you upside your head? Was he berating you and calling you every other name, disrespectful name that you could ever think of, and spitting in your face and stuff like this? Was he doing any of those things to you, uh, you know, when you had first reported between that time and summer league? No. <laughs> Man, like, it's so sad how people overblow situations that it, it don't even make sense. Like, I could not be a Michael Jordan or a LeBron James because people want to believe so much negative stuff about you that I just couldn't do it. I don't know how they deal with it. But no, like, do, do does he say certain stuff in his jokes? Yeah, that's, he's just a regular person. 
But the thing that the thing that I come to the internet with is like, if he wasn't MJ, you wouldn't even be offended by what he just said. So you ain't even really have no no y'all ain't had no beef. Y'all was cool at that time. It was everything right, you know, cool. You going and doing your work and he just checking you out and it's just everything cool. Y'all joking, whatever. No beef, no issue, no problem, no none of this. You no know saying disrespect, none of that stuff. No slapping upside the head and all this stuff people trying to put out here. None of that, right? No. Nah, none of that. Right. They giving he's giving pointers to the young guys, uh especially uh LeBron Prophet. He's one of the guys that used to go to the gym all the time. They used to cook MJ one on one. They used to cook, boy. But mm. uh LeBron LeBron has some one on one. He has some game when you play him one on one. Um but no, he was just more so he would watch you play and then he'll pull you to the side and he'd tell you certain things you need to work on. And when he wasn't doing that, he's just joking like anybody else in the locker room. What was he saying to you specifically at that time? At that time, when you was between the time you was drafted and when you reported to go to something then, then summer league? He wanted me to uh he wanted me to work on elevating my uh jump shot. He said it was too flat. Cause I used to jump real high for my jump shot in the beginning, like Courtney Alexander. Um, so I could get it off on people that wasn't as tall, but now I'm playing against, you know, seven footers. So that flat jump shot, he was like, you'll make it, but you just got to raise it up by your ear. So they had me working a lot of one handed shots, a lot of stuff that he said that they would do at Carolina. Now you had guys, and I want to address this. Like when you went and did your measurements and stuff, you had clowns like Stephen A. Snitch. That would come out here and say, "Oh, well, he had small hands." Well, didn't the team know that before they drafted you, and they still drafted you number one? That small hands is a myth. They covered up the fact that I broke my hand in uh, at the University of Florida. Some guy got jealous over a girl that my friend was talking to, and they came over there, punched me and my homeboy in the face, and got into a fight. Broke my knuckle, broke the eighth bone in my wrist. So I had already broke. I broke the fourth and fifth metatarsal on this hand. So in the middle of a basketball game, I punched the wall when I missed the layup. So I, I broke that knuckle. And then uh, I broke that knuckle across that dude uh, temple. So it crushed the eighth bone in my wrist. So now I can't grip a basketball like I used to. Mm -hmm. I can move it around and do anything I used to, I wanted to do with it. But I broke my hand right after they drafted me. So... They was like, we could find you. We could do all kind of stuff. So that's how, you know, David Stern pulled me in and was like, you can't fight. You can't do this. You're the number one draft pick. I'm like, a dude punched me in my face. Oh, so, oh, like, so hold on. So this story, we, we ain't never heard this. So David Stern yeah. actually called you in? Man. <laughs> me and David Stern wanted to kick me out the league because I wouldn't answer his question. He kept saying, do you understand? And I'm like, no, I don't understand. I don't understand that you want to turn me into somebody that got to accept somebody assaulting me. So he was like, because you're the number one draft pick, you can't fight nobody. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm standing in a, uh, in a little team spot. A guy hit me and you don't want me to fight. He wanted to tell me that I'm wrong for just even being there. And I'm like, I don't agree with you. And so Damn, David Stern really was harsh like that. Everybody said he was, yeah. he was, they said David Stern was so man. If David Stern was in these days, what John Morant them dudes been going out the league? They wouldn't even be in league no listen, more. Like this. He, listen, John Morant wouldn't have had a chance. David Stern was finna kick me out of the league because I would not say I understand. Uh, I owe if it wasn't for Chris Chin, I know a lot of people know Chris Chin. Yeah, you good? Go ahead. Okay, I know a lot of people know Chris Chin. Um, she used to work for the Players Association. And she just kind of, because I'm sitting there boiling. I'm ready to hit his ass at this point. He's <laughs> trying to, like, I'm young. Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, dog. <laughs> yeah, so, they, listen, they flew me out. As soon as they found out about it, they flew me out right away. I had to go to David Sir right away. I'm going straight to David Sir. Because as soon, as soon as they heard about my, I broke my hand, the team found out about it. And then David Stern like, no, nah, you got to come to New York. So I flew to New York 
And I, I'm going in the office, like the principal office. He like, what the what the fuck are you doing? And da, 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 he cursing me out and shit. I'm out like, of nowhere. So you thinking, so hold on. At the draft, you thinking he cool, he's shaking your hand, talking all cool, all nice. Man, this and motherfucker he, cursing me out like a dog. What the fuck are you doing? Da, 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 da. You can't be fighting in a bar. Do you understand? He's he talking to me like I'm a kid. I'm looking at him. I'm 19. I, I'm young. I come from an era where, you know, you don't talk to nobody like that. So I'm looking at her, and I'm looking at Chrissy T, and she's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. And I'm like, my first thing was like, I don't know who you think you're talking to like that. I said, but I don't understand. If somebody hit me, I'm going to hit their ass back. I'm sorry. <laughs> so that kind of fucked up me in the face of the league, probably. So damn, I ain't never, I never knew he got mad at you like that about that, bro. That's crazy, bro. Man, that dude there is crazy. He he was crazy, man. He cursed so, me out too. So guys bad. like so so guys like Zion with all that stuff he got going on, Draymond Green. Draymond Green would have been out the league, huh? Oh man. If he would have saw him punch a player like that, he'd have been out of the league. He'd have been he'd have, he'd have, he'd have sent him out the league. Mm -hmm. He's and then then you after that. After the punch, you stump a dude in the chest. You you choke a dude and drag him 20 feet across the court. And then you backhand punch the dude. Nah. There ain't no way, ain't no no way. way in hell, man. <laughs> no way. They, David Stern wanted me to apologize for getting arrested in Valdosta. It was an illegal arrest. It took my attorney two days to get it thrown out uh, after we went to court. But soon I got arrested falsely uh, for disorderly conduct. He tell me to come to New York again. He going off on me. This is that, and I'm just sitting here looking at him like this got to be an agenda or something to try to make me look bad because I wasn't convicted of anything. Right. I'm like I asked him after he did all that yelling. I'm like, why are you talking like that when I know I was falsely arrested and it's going to be proven? And he was like, you don't know that. You don't know that. I'm like, I do know that. And I'm like, you wasn't there. I'm like, shouldn't you summon me in after I get convicted? Why, as soon as I get charged with something, you or any allegation come out about me, you want to come? Me, you want me to fly to New York for you to talk to me? And I, I just thought that was weird. Man, that's crazy, bro. I never knew that story. So, man, I, you was about to get kicked out the league before everything started. It's like they was trying to kick me out the league the whole time. <laughs> man, bro. And how did they find? Oh, so they they had to find out about your fight because you broke your hand. So you had to basically just. You know what I'm saying? Tell them what tell them what happened. And they ain't even want to listen to your side of the story. They just, hey man, it's you. You can well, I went to the I went to the practice facility. Uh and uh Tom Ostrom saw how swollen my wrist was and my hand was because I was down in uh, uh Gainesville when this happened. So and I was hooping, I was hooping with the team, and this just happened right in the bar. Just boom, broke my hand. And so uh I used to I actually bought a house in Gainesville right across the street from Billy Donovan. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I went in there and I was practicing. Uh, I was finna practicing. They was like, what the heck is going on with your hand? It's all swollen. And before you know it, they had called the Washington Wizards, let them know everything. Before I, they were like, hey, we heard what happened. Come see us. So now you go to Summer League. Mm -hmm. uh, you played in Summer League? Yeah. Now, how did that go for you? How, how did you feel like your experience in Summer League was? And – did you have any – was you was you still in an interaction with Michael Jordan during summer league? Yeah, but it was different then. After I broke my hand, he was pissed off at me then, boy. Like, because my hand and my wrist was different. I had this big assist on my wrist, this big boil that it really needed to have surgery to take it out. Um, but they – I think me breaking my hand really messed up that trade. I think that was a part of, a part of it. Because the team knew about it, and I really needed surgery on that on my wrist to take that out. But they was like, "Nah, you, you ain't for the. We drafted you number one. We ain't for to have you do all that." Uh, because the the doctor said I needed to break that knuckle or pull it back forward and put a pin in it. But the team was like, "Nah, we just gonna let you figure it out." Mm -hmm. Now, um, so during the summer league, everything was going smooth for you. You had no issues with Jordan, none of this stuff. And how was you? Nah. What was your feedback from the team as far as their plan for you going during that season, from summer league on? Yeah, I mean that was just getting me back in shape because you know that's that's right when I had to sit out for a while, recover from that. I was about eight weeks out, uh, recovering from my hand and my wrist 
being different. So I'm trying to learn how to shoot the ball with my hand like that. Um, dudes was chopping my knuckle and it barely healed from being broken. And so it would swell up uh, after the game. My wrist would swell up after the game. So I would try to tape it, try to do different stuff. But I'm trying to figure this out during my rookie season and my whole hand is different now. Uh, sometimes when it's cold outside, my fucking hands don't, it just didn't even want to squeeze nothing. And it's all because I, I broke those knuckles. And, you know, I wish that so, they didn't happen at that bar, but shit, it did. So, but everything was cool. Even in summer league, you and Jordan never had no beef, no issue, no, no hitting you, putting hands on you, none of this stuff. No, I don't know where this hitting of the hit, like MJ. Oh, we gonna, we gonna, we gonna clear it up. We gonna clear it up. We gonna clear it up. We gonna clear all this up. The way he slapped that dude in the back of the head uh, at that at, on the bench, now that was a little aggressive. But he will pop you in the back of your goddamn head. Have I been on the receiving end of one of those? Yeah, MJ. We gonna hold. On. We gonna get into that. Hold that. All right, hold that. We gonna get. We gonna get into that. We gonna get into that. We gonna get into yeah. that. So, cause I want. We gonna. Cause see, this is gonna be a true serum for people today. So now, you you finish summer league. Now, at the end of summer league, as you're getting ready to approach training camp. Do they still come with you with a plan going into that first year? No, nah, because as we went to training camp, MJ announced that he was coming back. So even even after summer league, up until the season started, they never came to you and said, "Hey, Kwame, you you are number one overall pick. This is our plan for you. This is what we want you to do. This is what we expect of you. This is what you're going to be doing. This is your plan. How, how much you're going to be playing? Blah, say blah. None, none of that. No. Nah. Everything instantly turned to Jordan once Jordan announced he was coming back. Yeah, I mean, I can feel something was different because, like, uh, my agent that I had, he was asking me the questions that you asked me, like, uh, are they are they telling you what they want you to do, what position? And I'm like, nah, one minute he says the three, the next minute he said this. Um, he didn't tell me about minutes, none of that. So, this is Doug Collins, right? Yeah, it just seemed like they already knew that what they was going to do with that pick. Okay, so now let's go to training camp. Now, when you in training camp, do you see a different Michael Jordan than you saw when you were first drafted? <laughs> yeah. That's now it. let's get into let's get into that. Let's get into that. Now, <laughs> now what, what what type of time was Mike on from day one in training camp, bro? At age thirty eight years old, thirty nine years old. He on Mike. He on like some big brother, little brother shit. You know what I mean? Like uh, he don't believe in young guys playing without earning them. Um, so, uh, that he had, he had a lot of drills that he would have the rookies do. The rookies always had to run for the veterans. Ooh, Mike, so Mike to, or the, Mike or Doug Collins? No, Mike, like the rookies, like he'll get his work in, but it, it was always something the rookies had to do for the veterans. Like he, he was big on that, like making the rookies earn their keep. And I'm, I'm certain that these guys ain't going through that now, but. He he was big on yeah. I, we ain't running. Anytime we got a deep six, you run mine. And it was crazy. That's crazy, man. So, okay, I be so, done ran three. I be done ran three or four of them joints. You only supposed to run one of them. So Mike, Mike is working out the rookies. Yeah, like he was just making sure, like he, he makes sure you go through the grind unless you go to unless you went to North Carolina. But everybody else, you, you get that, that you get right. that work. At this time, did you have a feeling that you were going to? Did you know that you were going to start at this time, or did, were they putting you in the starting lineup and practice and stuff like that with the first five? How was that going in practice when you were? No, nah, it seemed like it seemed like MJ strategically picked guys that he trusted, and he knew he had an older team, so he was trying to get younger with Elton Brand. Uh, it was a it was a couple other trades that he wanted to make happen because I wasn't going to be the only person in a trade, so it was going to be Elton Brand. So hold on, so at this time, so between let, let's let's get this right. So between the summer league and the regular season, I mean the beginning of the regular season, Jordan wanted to trade you for Elton Brand. Yeah, because he knew Christian Leitner and Popeye Jones wasn't going to be the ones to get it done. So yeah, he that they were trying to get Elton Brand to. Um, to the Washington Wizards, but they end up going with Tyson Chandler uh, because A. Poland said no. So Tyson Chandler was on that Wizards team too? No, Tyson Chandler was with the Clippers. And uh, 
So that's how Elton Brand ended up going from Chicago to the Clippers because uh, uh, A. Poland blocked the trade. Okay, I got you now. So now that oh, was Mike upset about that? How was Mike feeling about that? I knew I was I knew I was in trouble then. <laughs> so they that had hold on. So this this is when A. Poland and Mike is bumping heads in the in the front office a little bit. Yeah, see, A. Poland had come to the realization that hey, we traded Ben Wallace. Rasheed Wallace, all of these guys we trade from here, uh, Jawan Howard, they go up to other teams and they play well. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to keep this pick. And that pissed MJ the hell off. And so now that's when he started, started treating me different. Yeah. So now he took it out on you, basically, what you saying that they wouldn't move you. And the reason yeah. why he wanted to move you is because he wanted a more veteran guy in there. Mm-hmm. At that time, for his, for his last hurrah, I felt like he felt like if he would have got Elton Brand and a couple of pieces that get him to the playoffs, uh, then he could turn into MJ and do something magical. Um, he really just wanted to get into the playoffs, right? Okay, so now when they, when they refuse to do that deal, uh, what is his demeanor like with you in practice now, and and when you're around him around the team? Shit, he mad with everybody. He's short, with, especially with me. <laughs> He's short with everybody. It was, it was less joking. It was less playing and more like, let's let's just get the business. And I don't think he got told no too many times in his life. So now, as you guys getting ready to go into the preseason, are you starting? Um, No. I'm barely who, even playing. Who was starting in front of you at that time? At that time, it was either Christian Leitner and Popeye Jones. That was starting was in like, front of you at that time. Christian Leitner, more than likely. So, how are you feeling at that time? That I'm the number one overall pick, and man, they ain't, I ain't even really. It only like I'm in the plans. Well, they kept coming up with excuses. I did more being in the weight room than anything. They had me working out. Well, you too light, and so I worked out, and got bigger. And okay, now you too heavy. Okay, then I did extra work, did suicides to lose the weight again. And it was like, it was always an excuse. It will sit me down uh, four games in a row then throw me in in garbage minutes. And, and you you already know how it go. You played this game. You go in with four minutes left, uh, down 25. Everybody's shooting the ball. It's a free-for-all. They ain't passing you the ball. You ain't learning nothing. But then when they'll finally put me in a game of some substance, and I get some real minutes when Christian Leitner get hurt. Uh, I end up with 13 points, 19 rebounds. Then I won't play again till you know, another 10 games. Now, as that season starting, and you're not – in the preseason starting, you're not starting, you're not getting that much time, how are you – how is the media treating you at that time? Uh, the media act like I wasn't there. And then once MJ – it, it kind of like – it did two things to have MJ there. It made people not talk about you until he lost, until it didn't work out. And then they said, oh, well, it was because he got that number one draft pick. Well, how the hell is it my fault? I'm playing 14 minutes a game. I'm barely getting in. You, you snatching me in, throwing me out. You can't, a player, if you can't get a rhythm and be consistent, then you're not going to get consistent play. Okay, so basically the media is not even really paying you no attention. There ain't no real pressure. And so- no. Because it's funny because you fast forward and Stephen A. Smith act like there was all these expectations on you from day one. And you were, he make it seem like you you were out there playing 40, 35, 40 minutes a game and you wasn't producing this, that, and the third. So, yeah, that, that's that's kind of funny. But, um, as we that, this, this is why this is why Stephen A. is a clown because there's a thing called analytics and plus minus. That's the reason why I kept getting contracts. When they did play me 30 minutes at that time at my position, Kevin Garnett, uh, Tim Duncan were the two top guys at my position. And so when you looked at my minutes per game, uh, points per minute, when you look at my points per minute, rebounds per minute, it was on like the same scale as KG when I played 35 plus minutes. I was giving you a double double every time, but it just wasn't consistent. So you would have a game of where a guy played four minutes. Then you'll get 10 DMPs, and then you'll get a guy playing 38 minutes. 
And so your offense is not as great when you're not playing consistent. But I've always rebounded well. I always got put back. So the numbers was cool. Man, that's crazy, man. So so now you're going into the regular season. The first se- uh, game of the season, are you starting? Your first professional game, are you starting? I came off the – look, my first professional game. Damn, I don't even remember. We were in New York. No, I came off the bench. So you came off the bench the first game. And – when did you start starting at this time? Well, that, that game, I popped my ankle. So I was out that first game. I, I blocked the shot, came down, popped my foot. I was out for six weeks. Man, so that so now this is another setback mm-hmm. that threw you back um, in this whole situation. A lot of yeah. people don't talk about this stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. glad we getting through this because a lot of this stuff, man, I ain't even know, bro. I ain't know you went through all this stuff, bro. A lot of people didn't even know. It wasn't yeah. told like this. The story ain't never been told like this. It never got told from you. It got told from other people. And all mm-hmm. we had to do was all we had was to go off of, and all everybody else have is to go off what other people say, not the dude yeah. who was there. You see what I'm right. saying? Some people going some people gonna come in the comments and say, Oh, uh Kwame Captain, he captain. How you how you know he captain? He was there, you wasn't there. So well, this shit, I was at, I was at the I was at the rehab facility learning how to close my hand again because I done busted up my knuckle and my wrist. So, and then right. they double that small hands, and they tell me not to say nothing. I don't have the biggest hands in the world, but my hands are big enough to do anything I need to do on the court. That's how I got to the number one draft pick. But uh, right. I shattered my hand uh, in that little fight. Right. So you now you pop your you pop your ankle. So you out for six weeks. Mm-hmm. So now that sets you back even more. And then so now those- Doug Doug started going crazy. MJ was being quiet. At this point, MJ is not really talking now. And uh, Doug, is he's ramped up his conversation. And it's all negative. And, uh, Doug hold on. So, like, hold on. When you say Doug ramped up his conversation all negative, explain that to the people so everybody can understand what you what you, what you mean by that. Uh, I just think, to me, Doug Cow- Collins is not a real coach. He don't motivate. He don't, he don't build up. He just tears down. And then he used tactics like, it's weird. Like I, you, you just get frustrated with him. Like I, I really dreamed about choking the life out of this motherfucker. Man, like, nobody knew all this, bro. Like seriously, nobody like knew. I don't find it respectful when you, hey JB, tell Kwame I said this and this and that, and I'm like, I can hear you. No, like like ask the Tom Thomas about it. He'll literally treat you like a, a thing, a boy. Like I, I don't need you to say out loud in front of another man to tell me something when I can hear you. And then when you challenge him on that, he gets worse. Like you're a teenager, you need to learn how to be respectful. I'm like, I'm not being disrespectful to you. Like you disrespected me, motherfucker, I hear you. <laughs> and so, I, I, I couldn't get along with him. And he would always bring up my age. Like I, I was more mature for my years. So I know that you disrespected me, but because of my age, he won't be the like, Bow down. It's like, nah, nigga, you being this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, <laughs> hey, no. What do you, you say? What do you say? <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> that shit used to be uh, weird, man. He tried to talk to you like you was a kid, man. <laughs> Man, I never, I never, I never met a person like that in my life. I never had no. somebody say, "Tell him this, tell him that." When I'm right here listening to you, <laughs> say. bro, you said you told him. <laughs> and then the oh, motherfucker, he, he used to get so excited, like, like <laughs> one little mistake, one little mistake. This motherfucker go to licking his lips, running around, pop. Oh, oh, damn it. Oh. What kind of shit is that? What kind of food is that? Tiny I'm like, oh my god, this motherfucker. Oh. <laughs> was he was he just doing that for you? Or was he doing that for everybody, man? He was oh. doing it especially for me, but he he would do oh. it for everybody. Like, like oh. listen, he he rolled Jihadi White so hard one day, man. Jihadi White went to block a shot, and I swear to God. This nigga tore the net off of the rim. I swear, with one spike. I said, this nigga is a silverback. 
Most motherfuckers that'll tell you that'll break your fingers. <laughs> this nigga, you know how they white is. <laughs> that nigga, that nigga is a silverback gorilla. I hope you see this shit. That motherfucker ripped the net off the goddamn rim trying to block a shot. That was oh. fucking silverback. Oh, hey no, hey no. You think I'm bullshit? That nigga a silverback, bro. Oh, hey, hey, bro. Hey, hold on, man. Oh, oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> I remember Jahidi, bro. Man, that nigga there is boiling here. Big, big, big mother. <laughs> Don't get everything. When I saw him do that shit, I said, oh, I'm not fucking with him. Oh, man, bro. Oh, man, dog. Oh, man. Hey, bro, hold on. I got to pause the interview, bro. Hold on a second. We back, man. I had to stop. I had to stop because I, I pictured that. When you said it about Doug Collins, I pictured him being a little, a little asshole complaining about every little thing, bro. That's crazy, man. That's yeah, crazy, bro. They fancy so, they fancy Doug as some type of genius, but I didn't like his like his Gustavo tactics. He would always find a player or two that he would pin against another player. He would he would really get the guys damn near to fight. Like I, I didn't like the optics of that. This white guy, like we supposed to be here playing basketball. Like I, I didn't understand that shit. I hated so it. So that's the hold on. So let's get this right. So after you got hurt, when you got you got hurt the first game. Mm -hmm. So when you got hurt, they was the losses racking up quick, even without you being out there. Oh man, they happening so fast. They, they keep trying to rush me back, and and that's a lot to do with uh, um, a lot a lot of my uh, bad play. Like he, Doug Collins is the type of coach that he would do things to make you want to just play back and be a part of the team because he'll isolate you, have you in rehab at uh he'll he'll do dumb shit like uh be at rehab at 8 30. 8 30 I live an hour away. I live in Virginia. So I gotta get up at 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. Then they want to keep you there till six o'clock in the afternoon. It ain't that much damn icing and stemming in the world. So they wanted they was crack going crazy over your injury. He was doing that on purpose so that he does that to people on purpose so they can try to come back early. Like he if you if you're out, then it's like he was cracking a whip trying to make you say, Well, damn, I don't want to have to be here all day. Cause you would have to be there. Man, I I remember like, damn, I'm getting to the gym. I don't even get to see my daughter. I don't get to see my family because I gotta be right back at this motherfucker so early and she sleep because she gotta go to daycare. And I live way out in Virginia, so I got to drive to McLean. Anybody know D.C., you let somebody out at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the afternoon, they got to drive all the way out to McLean. You in traffic for another two hours. So, and I got to wake back up and do this all over again, all because I got a coach that's trying to make me say, fuck it, man, take me off the IR, because I'm tired of going through this shit. So the moment you can walk or do anything, you're trying to come back to play. Man, bro. So in between this time, you watching the, when you're out, out, and you watching the, are you watching the practices even when you hurt? No, nah, they, they keep you away from everybody. It's like you, it's like fuck you until you come back. <laughs> <laughs> you in the training room. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. You know, sometimes normally, if you yeah. hurt, they'd be like, look, come check out the practice. We got practice today. Whatever, whatever. You know what I'm saying? You get your yeah. you get your therapy, you get your treatment, whatever, before or after. During the practice, they let you sit there and watch the practice, whatever. They won't even try and let you watch the practice, bro. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, he has a listen. I wonder if Grant Hill can confirm this story because I heard he he did Grant Hill the same way. But I'm I'm telling you, you are miserable not playing like. You you would rather limp up and down the goddamn court than to have to, you know what I mean? Do all that shit. Practice normally start at ten thirty. You there at eight eight thirty, and you there all fucking day. And I'm like, damn, we done did this tens unit ten times. 
So what time? Hold on. What time was you going in the gym? <clears throat> Uh, and and what time was you leaving? Shit, if you injured, you had to be there like two hours before everybody else. They wanted you to get treatment before practice. They he always had a rule: injured people get here before practice start. So then the trainer would say, "Oh shit, let's do eight thirty, you know, eight 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 o'clock." Some of the cool trainers would do nine nine fifteen. That way, you get a little more time to get down there. But uh, yeah, it was mostly like eight eight thirty. And so and they, were sending, them, they were sending reports to him on what time y'all was getting there. Oh man, they snitching every second of every day. <laughs> <laughs> man, they checking your weight. They doing everything. I'm like, what the? How the fuck can I lose weight if I'm injured? I can't even fucking walk. Why are you putting me on a scale every damn day? It don't make sense. It's like it was a way to goddamn try to make it seem like you wasn't working hard so they can go. And Doug is the type that he'll go leak things or say shit to the media so that it don't look like it's his fault. And I'm like, wow, this shit is crazy. Anything <laughs> that went on with me, it came from Doug. Damn, dog. Man, bro. So Doug is the one that's out there talking. So really, it looked like, to be honest with you, bro, when you got hurt and you went out, and them losses piled up, Doug started to get frustrated. And he took his frustration out <clears throat> on a young guy like you. And you said he was talking to you like he was a kid and stuff like that? Man, it's like I would talk to him with logical sense. Like, why do you need to get him to tell me that? Because even, even he would be like, like, the coach would be like, why the fuck? He's like, I don't need to do that. He got he even argued with him one day, like, no, I'm not doing that. I, I already, we don't need to do this no more. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> he only hired like flunky coaches around right like, it, it was weird he had these flunky coaches that uh just did what he said now so so you now the real thing is now you battling with doug collins yeah so you get back from the injury once you get back from oh so hold on well he, he was arguing with you why you was injured Oh man, it's every day is something. He'll take. Hold on, what, what is he? Hold on, what what is he arguing with you about? So this ain't even Mike. This this is no. Doug Collins fucking with you while you hurt. What is he arguing yeah. with you about? Why you injured, bro? Man, I be in a boot. He'll just walk by me and, and, and do like the UPS sign. What can Brown do for you? And then he'll Come walk on, off. <laughs> he say little shit like that. And I'd be like, damn, motherfucker, I'm trying to come back from the injury. You keep fucking with me. <laughs> <laughs> so it made me not want to be around him. And then after I got healthy and I'm playing well, he want to be my friend. I'm like, I don't need no now. How was like now, now hold on. How was they? How was Doug Collins running practice? How was his practice? Explain one of Doug Collins' practices. What y'all doing when y'all go in? He writing up all these damn elaborate play, uh, plays. First, we got to stretch. Uh, we stretch for like 30 minutes. Then he argued with the stretch coach because he wanted it down to 15 minutes because every he's a meticulous dude. Everything got to work by the, the time, and he's crunching everything in. So um, he loved to talk. So he would talk to us for a minute. Uh, we would do the three-man weave. Uh, then we'd do the, the four-man weave, five-man weave, and then it'll be three-on-two, two-on-one. And then that's how we started every day. We, we After we stretched, we got the little the weave going, and then we started got straight into competition, right off the rip. Now, and then after the competition, he have a couple of breakdowns. Okay, you have some breakdowns after the competition. After the competition, he had breakdowns. He he throw in a couple of plays. Have you run the set? Because he he wrote a play every other damn day. That's what, that that is what he is good at drawing up plays. Right. So he he would write plays. He would put the play in, and then now, after you run through the play, walk through the play four to five times, now y'all competing against each other just running that play. Right. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you this question. Why did Mike like Doug Collins if Doug was this much of a, a, of a, of a guy? Because he an ass kisser to the top guy. He didn't treat Mike like that. Mike oh, so the way he treated everybody, he didn't treat Mike nowhere near the way he treated everybody else. How was his interaction with Michael Jordan, Doug Collins, and, and the practices game, stuff like that? Yeah, it's whatever he wanted. Mike was the coach. Doug was, Doug was there to write up the play, but 
the play is for Micah. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's a match made. It's always on in with Mike, ain't it? <laughs> Every damn play is for Mike. So and, and Doug was very good at drawing up plays. So that's I, I, probably one of the reasons why he loved him. He ain't talk shit to MJ. And he's going to write every play for him. And it's a good play. Mm -hmm. So now you get back. Y'all, the losses don't piled up. How is Mike built? How is the, what is Mike's demeanor as the losses started to build up? Why you was hurt coming into when you're coming back from the injury? He, he ain't talking to you. Anytime he talking to you, he, either he asking you when you coming back or he just cracking a joke on you. And that's that's it. Ain't no interaction. Ain't no no talk like we like. Mm -hmm. That sounds like Kobe Bryant, like you said Kobe was. Him and Kobe similar in that. Like if we ain't winning and you ain't healthy, we ain't talking. It's like they don't see you no more. Nigga. We here to work and you ain't working, boss. So hey. <laughs> Man, <laughs> so, so, but how was you observing Mike with the other guys as you still hurt, get ready to come back, watching the practice? How was Mike as they losing these games, man? man is he going off on dudes? Is he hitting other dudes? Is he cussing other dudes out? How was that? Oh, he cussed everybody out. You're going to get cussed out. But right. uh, Mike going to cuss your ass out. <laughs> yeah, he going to cuss you out. Right. But he knew how to turn it off more than – uh Kobe did. Uh, MJ right. would turn it off and then get on the plane. He uh, like he going ham in, in the locker room or whatever else, or either he's quiet. He's you gonna get one or two MJ. Either you gonna get him when he pissed off and he going off, or he ain't gonna say nothing. And when he ain't saying nothing, he like that on the bus. He's like that till he gets to that card table. <laughs> then he back talking again. <laughs> Kobe, there was a difference between Kobe in that situation. Kobe, Kobe going on the whole time. Kobe going to the back of the bus. He's going <laughs> to his little spot of the plane, and you bet not stop by his goddamn seat. I'll tell you that right now. You bet not even pause by his seat. Uh, he's cussing your ass out. <laughs> Motherfucker, Kobe was on that. You ain't do nothing in the game. Don't, don't say shit to me. Kobe was like, over. Kobe, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, hold on, hold on. But Kobe went taking dudes food from him. They play well. Was he? No, I ain't see him do all that. But he definitely not talking to you at all. <laughs> MJ is something about once he he on he liked that on the, in the in the locker room on the bus. Right. Boy, that card table be called. Oh yeah, he, oh, he get that card table. We forget everything, huh? Yeah, he talking to a lower spade, high spade. <laughs> uh, yeah, they talking again. <laughs> Why he meanwhile why he taking your money, huh? <laughs> oh, find a way. Taking the shit out there, buddy. <laughs> hey man, so how was the interaction with the other dudes with Mike? Was anybody like everybody afraid of Mike on the team or pretty much did anybody nah, stand up? Jerry to Mike? Stackhouse, well, most people was afraid of him for sure. Um, but Stackhouse, he, he now he different. Stackhouse, yeah. Stackhouse, Stackhouse will throw down with you. I know about Stackhouse. Stackhouse, Stackhouse wanted to whip him. <laughs> now what now what was now what is going on between Stackhouse and Mike at this time? Because I know Stackhouse, Stackhouse thought he was the man. He thought he was the man, and then he realized there's a pecking order. And uh Stackhouse didn't like that. He felt like he should get the he should be the first option. And you, you gotta think about it. Our first option was 39, 40. Uh and Stackhouse was younger. He was, you know, he was playing well, but Stackhouse had game, bro. Yeah, so Stackhouse wanted to run the offense through him. Uh and uh you know, you MJ these, both no, these are both North Carolina boys too, y'all. Man, they hated each other. In my That's opinion. First, I never seen two North Carolina boys. I never seen or heard about Mike hate another North Carolina guy like like him and Jerry Stackhouse wanted. Yeah. Stackhouse wanted the ball. That's the show. So Stackhouse, he wasn't trying to come up off the ball for Mike. No, nah, he said his exact words was, "I ain't, he, I ain't come here to be your fucking Scotty Pippen." God dang, <laughs> man! And how did Mike respond to Stackhouse? How did Mike deal with Stackhouse, man? It was about to be a man-to-man -man situation, but you know, cooler heads prevail. People got in the way. Uh, Mike ain't no punk. That's the. Oh, well, already. Right. Now we gonna clear that up now. <laughs> See, people think Mike was just a punk and had dudes doing. Man, Mike a step to you, man. 
Yeah. I heard about that. They yeah, was about to have the meetings out of mine. And so was Mike giving it to him in practice or were they on the same team? Um, After that little back and forth, they would break up the team and let them compete. Um, Mike would have his days where he'd just call out. He'd call out Brian Wilson. I'm going to tear your ass up today. Uh, it's going to be just like when I whooped your ass in Utah. <laughs> you can't go be sick again. This is how he's talking to people. Like, he, he a jokester. Like, I'm telling you, he's he coming in with the smoke. There's an old nigga that's coming in with the smoke. So I could imagine how he was coming into practice when he was younger. Man, that's crazy, bro. So as you as you getting back now from injury and you're on the court, how is your relationship with Doug Collins at this time now that you come back from injury? Where are you at? Are you in the start? Are you in the lineup? Are you coming off the bench? How are they working you back in from your injury? Uh, he's just throwing me in in garbage minutes, and uh, we uh, we we wasn't talking. Like I was avoiding him. Uh, and so he would he would uh, get mad that I would go to other assistant coaches to work out because uh, at first he's telling the media that he don't like the work. But now the media is seeing me in there every day, but I'm not ever around the head coach. I'm always around an assistant coach and we getting work done. So they seeing me get faster. They seeing me get stronger. They seeing my ankles start to come around. And yeah, so he, he was a little jealous. So you basically working yourself, doing doing the things you need to do. Um, as you're back in, uh, the relationship with Mike in the practice, no no run-ins, no 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 serious situations between you and him, no no arguments stuff like that. No, nah, I started getting healthy and started setting. He started to notice I set good screens and I, I attacked the offensive rebounds and so. Uh, we I had a good little stretch where I was hitting open shots and they was passing me the ball. We, we had we had it rolling for a second. The little small games that we did win, but um, even the games that we lost, it was it was real competitive games, and that's what people got to understand. You got to work your ass off just to lose. <laughs> like, right. like it's 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 hard to win. It's it's hard to lose. It's definitely hard to win, but it's hard to lose as well. Right. So um, now. As you're back, when did you did you, when did they start really upping your minutes in, in your rookie year? Um it, they really didn't up my minutes like that in my rookie year. It it was kind of like I played the I, because I got injured so many times, I kind of played like the reserve role until maybe re, like when they rested the veterans, like when they knew we wasn't gonna make the playoffs, then they let us play. They let all the young guys play like that last month of the season. Um, and we got we got the rolling. And what I is, think Stackhouse was still in there. Right. So what is the media saying stuff about you at this point? Uh in they the only saying the negative stuff. Like they So they're only saying that. stuff that Doug Collins is feeding them about you. Yeah. And and so they're not looking at okay, he's the they're just stating uh facts. They're stating facts, but they're not putting in the gray area. They're like Oh, this is the number one draft pick that high, that had the lowest amount of points in um, NBA history, but it's also the lowest minutes. No, no number one draft pick only got in during garbage minutes, but Doug would tell them he would give them a story on the reason why it's happening, and I'm just like, you know, when they rushed me back, I forgot this part. When they rushed me back uh, from tearing up my ankle, I end up hurting my hamstring in a game because I shouldn't have been playing yet. So I'm back out again because I pulled my hamstring. <laughs> and what is Doug Collins on then when you got hurt Boy, again, man? Man, it, <laughs> listen. Listen. It, it's, you got to pull up to the gym and go through the back door trying to avoid Doug. After Come on, man. Hamstring. I'm telling you, it's like I got injured and it was just like, <laughs> it like, fuck this nigga. Oh man, bro! So you he feel the tension? Like they don't make them like they used to. That what they say? Yeah. <laughs> so you hot at this time, man? So you hate Doug Collins pretty much at this time? The fucking hate him with a passion. <laughs> <laughs> you so you going into work every day despising your coach, man? That's crazy. Yeah. So and he, and he just keep doing a little shit to fuck with you. Yeah, he, he would antagonize you. And, and I remember a time where Tom was about to swing on him, 
and I like was like a ton. I I jumped in like you're not gonna fuck this up, man. You you got your mama, you got people you gotta take care of. But he he would antagonize. Uh, to me, he would antagonize us black players especially. Like I didn't I didn't really like Doug. Like I I think he has very low respect for for I think black people, uh, mm. and I think he has especially a low respect for people that he don't think is as smart as he is. Man, that's crazy. I never knew that, man. So look, at this time, in your first year, Oak's not on the team that first year. Nah, he came that Okay, second. okay, cool. So y'all big man is you, Leitner, Popeye mm -hmm. Jones, and uh, Jahidi White. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and it's and it's Tom Thomas and Eton, big Eton Thomas. Shout out to Eton Thomas, man. Salute to Eton, man. Uh, what are they telling you this whole time that you're going through it? And are they seeing how Doug is, is treating you and stuff like that? What are they, what are these guys saying to you? Are they seeing you get upset and frustrated with how Doug is because you said you argue back with him a couple times and stuff like that? Uh, what are the vets, what are they, those guys outside of Mike? What are those guys saying to you? And, or was Mike ever like trying to help you through the process? Like, how, how was that? No, nah, it was like he was he was more quiet. Like he just let Doug. Maybe it came from Mike, but he just let Doug. It was more so Doug just doing his thing. He never stopped them from doing it, but he he wasn't really saying nothing at that point. And Doug would just he would go crazy. And he would say all kind of shit. And then I flashed off on him one or two times. And then the veterans would come and like, look, just don't say nothing. I understand that. You know what I mean? He 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 crazy, he going a little stupid. But you can't do that part. Just don't say nothing back. Just accept it and just keep moving. Who, who so was I your? Had to learn, I had to learn how to do that. Who was your? Who was the best? Who was the best on that team that you thought that treated you the best? That really was trying to help you and see you like succeed. Uh, Chris Whitney, um, Jahidi, Etan, and um, and even Oak when he got there at first, he was more. A disciplinary type of big, like an enforcer, but he actually showed me a lot. Like he'd take me in the weight room, show me a bunch of different workout drills. Like he's a militant type of dude, but if mm -hmm. you listen to some of the stuff that he's doing and, and you do some of the stuff that he's doing, it actually works. And right. so I, I had that happen for my second year and in Charlotte, and I, I ended up playing well. So that that now, all worked. Now going back to the first year, so late in the first year, as you seen y'all ain't gonna y'all not winning many games, y'all not not gonna make the playoffs. You didn't have any interactions, physical interactions with Mike. None of this stuff was going on. None at this mm -hmm. time of the season. He didn't nah. that, in that season. He didn't slap you upside your head. None of this stuff. Nah, I mean, I mean, I don't know. Like, man, Mike slapped everybody in the back of the head. I, he, I'm pretty sure. Now, give me, give me examples of how Mike was like, because people make it seem like Mike out here just punch, socking dudes out. Punching, punching dudes no. like, you know what I'm saying? Doing like, like, give, give, give an example to the people so they understand how you talking about. Because we, we saw how he did Malik Monk. Nobody really looked at that. Maliciously, people looked at it like, ah, oh, Mike, this, you know what I'm saying? Being Mike. Man, I, listen, I was like, I'm an antagonizer. I used to antagonize the hell out of them old ass veterans. I used to talk about them big ass parachute pants. I call them parachute pants. And them big ass pockets that he wear, them big jackets and suits and shit. So I was the young, I was the young kid going in there and fucking with them. So MJ would be like, "Man, get your little ass over away from here playing." And like I remember when we got Oak on the team, like I used, I used to get him back. I call, I call him sitting down on the um, plane, and I'm like, "Oh yeah," I said, "Okay, in here, say yeah," and I put him in the headlock. I'm in there yeah. choking him out, and, right. and Oak. Oh, jumped on the goddamn butt. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah. He <laughs> we, hey, look. Me behind, <laughs> he grabbed me from behind and pulled my arms behind me. And MJ, boom, 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 boom. Man. I'm like, all right, motherfucker, that's enough. Right. But, hey, look. I gave it and I took it. We we used to have fun. That, I thought that's how it's supposed to be. So it was none of that in your rookie year. It was none of this hazing stuff. None of that stuff going on. No, and, he, no, it was hazing. Now that motherfucker, I remember. It was fucking, we were at, uh, what were we, Minnesota. Minnesota, he said, hey, look, um, I didn't do something they wanted me to do. I didn't go get donuts or do some shit they told me to do. And he was like, hey, look here, all the other rookies, y'all stay on the bus. Kwame, go unload all the luggage. I'm out there by myself. It's fucking, you know how cold Minnesota get. 
Mm -hmm. It's a blizzard out this motherfucker. They he told all the uh, other people, all the uh, you know uh, uh, the equipment managers and everybody that usually help with the luggage. He told them to stand down. He was like, "You do that shit by yourself." I'm out there by myself throwing that luggage. He was like, I'm going to find your ass 60000 if you don't go do it. And I've got my ass out there. I needed my money. What's some of the other stuff they had you doing as rookies, like, as far as just, you know, how they, they, they fuck with the rookies, man? I had to go get condoms. I had to go get donuts. I lived in Virginia. I had to go to Maryland. I had to keep <laughs> a bag full of goddamn condoms. They send you on dummy missions. Oh, man. I had to go, uh, man, all kind of shit, man. And then... <laughs> Uh, the motherfucker kicked the ball in the stand so high one year, uh, uh, one game. He, boom, go get the ball, motherfucker. And, and if you don't hurry up, we're going to goddamn uh, leave you before the guy. Hold on, during the game? No, this was after shoot around. He kicked the goddamn ball to like the two, uh, 300 level. Yeah, go. <laughs> <laughs> and the nosebleeds, he and kicked it in the nosebleeds. Nose yeah, he, <laughs> he said, "Hurry up, motherfucker! If you the last one on the goddamn bus, we leave your ass. You can take oh, a taxi." Man. Man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's normal. That's normal stuff rookies go through, bro. That ain't nah, so. Because I know crazy. you probably. I, I know you. That. Hold on. Oh, so you never seen? Hold on. You never been on a team where they did rookies worse than than what y'all guy did in Washington? Not, not like that. We, we, uh, the rookies that we had, like. The rookies that I saw in Charlotte and different places, like they just required them to do like donuts and get the bags and get the net bags and all that. They wasn't no kicking no balls in the stands and shit. Matter of okay. fact, hold up, wait. I think Kobe did do that shit one time where he slung a ball or some shit. So Kobe, I think he did that one time. Right. Okay. So cool. So now, basically, your first year, you ain't really have no like y'all. You ain't had no fist fights with Mike. Did you get in any fights on the team? Your rookie year, was there any, like, interactions where you had to, like, okay, we're going to throw down? Uh, the only person I wanted to fight was Brendan Haywood. He just... Now, let's get to that. Now, he's University of North Carolina, too. Yeah. Now, what... Mike got all these... Mike had all them Carolina boys around him. Now, mm -hmm. what... What what happened between you and Brendan Haywood at this time? Because now, it ain't even you and Mike. It's you and Brendan Haywood. We was about to fight on the bench one game. On the bench? Yeah, it's a video out on the internet where he said something to me and I was ready to just slap the shit out of him. But he, uh, he, Brendan just like a, he say shit to you like to antagonize you for no reason. He like, they say he an only child, so he don't play well with others. He do this smart alecky type of, it's all, it's more effeminate than anything because it's like a consequence for you to say certain shit to people, but he like says it and think it's cool. Damn. So and you won't going for it. No. And so when you get to the when y'all find out y'all not going to the playoffs that first year, how, how what's the feeling, bro? What how how's the mood, bro? Shit. <laughs> Man, Mike was, he, was, Mike was heated, was a, won't he, bro? Nobody wanted to be in that locker room. When you losing and you lo you lose that much, nobody wanted to be there. It, it became a job instead of something that was fun. You know how this this is a game we all love. It's supposed to be fun. Um, but that much media coverage, that much attention uh, under those bright lights with the expectations of MJ. I don't know what they expected, but the world expected MJ was going to put a cape on and win a championship. And so it's kind of like this LeBron era. era. Once a superstar is not getting what they thought they would get, it's time to point out who's the problem. And, and I was the problem. The number one draft pick was the problem. So now they put all pretty much you see the, the whole season getting put on you. Yeah. When you didn't have no plan coming this season. You really wasn't starting to get no, no, no cuts out there. You really wasn't getting big minutes. But mm -hmm. now it's all on you. Is this guy didn't pan out and do what he's supposed to do? But that's basically what they're trying to say. Yep. So and so, go ahead. So in response to that, I went down to uh, IMG or something like that with uh, uh, Clifford Ray and Robert Parrish, and I went to work. That whole I finally summer. got myself healthy and it felt good. Now let's let's get into that, right? So. Oh, and by the way, how was Mike in the practices? He he was in there going hard in the practices. How was y'all's practices that that year? 
uh was y'all going hard in the practices and and um you know uh how was the practices after y'all was losing? Like, how was it? How was it? What was the practices like when y'all was losing? Was Doug going even more crazy and stuff like that? Or how, you know, a lot of punishment running, boy. He, uh, he had, I remember Hubert Davis was on the team and he was pissed the fuck off, boy. Uh, Doug would find a reason, uh, to make us run some punishment running. A guy missed a layup. All right, everybody line up. So he was just running it like a college type of situation. He ended up hurting a lot of the older players running it like a college. And then uh, Christian Leitner, I, I remember Christian Leitner cursed him out. And that that crushed him because he's a Duke fan. Uh, he's in love with Mike Krzyzewski for whatever reason. And since Christian right. Leitner is one of the greatest Duke players or college players that ever lived, uh, Christian told him, you nothing like uh, Mike. I don't even know why the fuck you... <laughs> he said something like, I don't even know why the fuck you even try to act like he's your mentor or admire you or something. Yes. And ever since then, boy, he rolled Christian Leighton. Uh, man, like, it was crazy, man. Man, that's crazy, bro. So, now you get from that year, you're working on this summer. Do you, do you see Mike during the summer? Are you talking to Mike, any of this stuff, or are you just doing what you do? Doing what I do, I he don't talk to you. No, he changed his number about every damn two months. You serious? Yeah. Man, Mike, crazy man. So, so Mike is, and, and again, Mike is competing in practice every day. He going in there trying to give it to dudes. How was what is what's his what's his what's his mode on? Oh, he he a killer in practice. Like he uh he go he goes in. He does that same routine. Uh, Kobe does it too, where. He, he's taking the shots over each shoulder. He's playing live speed where he's he's doing everything you see him doing the game, but he's doing it. Everything I saw him do, and it taught me a lot. Uh, MJ does everything game speed when he's in practice. Um, and, and sometimes game speed don't mean fast. Sometimes game speed is just under control getting to a spot. Mm -hmm. But it was beautiful to see him do it because sometimes, like, when you take that entry pass, he's going ahead and turning and hitting that shot. He'll do that right. seven times in a row, and he won't stop until he makes seven in a row. Then he's coming over the left shoulder, seven in a row, just turning up. Then he's inside pivoting, faking his shot. And it was seven, 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 seven for everything. And he's doing this game speed. So he's he talking about 45 minutes of doing this in different little spots. And it's all the spots where he worked at in the, on, on, in the game. Every spot, everything that you saw him do, he's already done it so many times because he's doing it in practice. Like the reason why you couldn't guard him because he don't even see you there. He's just trying to get to that spot that he always got to in practice. If you're there at that other spot, he already know the counter. And so it, it was it was effortless in the game because of the way you could see him work in practice. And I saw yeah, I him do it in late thirties. So imagine in his twenties. That remind me of my boy Corey Alexander, man. He did it. Uh -huh. He was the same way, bro. Corey used to get in there, little point guard, get in there, woo -woo -woo, just do his stuff. I mean, it didn't matter what you did in the game. He, the way he did in his drills and his and his work workout, that's exactly what he was doing. It, straight professional with it, bah, 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 right to it. You know what I'm saying? It didn't it didn't matter who was defending him, who was what. He he stuck to whatever he did, and then that's what he coming with. But yeah. so you get in the off season, you work hard, you get yourself right. Now, when you come back the second year with the Wizards, this is the last year of Mike's, of Mike's career. Uh, did they have a plan for you that year? No. It was all worried about, okay, did you get in any trouble? Did you? Oh, I went to jail that summer. Shit, I forgot. Oh, so you so, – oh, hold on. So what happened now? <laughs> they pissed off because I, I went to jail that summer. Seems like every time I went home, I went to jail for something. So I went to jail for speeding uh, my rookie year. Uh, and then when I got there that summer, um, I don't know, what did I go to jail for that summer? I think I went to jail for DUI, a suspicion of DUI. And I'm like, dude, I didn't even drink. I'm like, I only had a, like a beer. Like, what are you talking about? I was like, I'm going to get the guy to drive right now. Like, there's no way you can say I'm drunk. And he was like, oh, no, um, I don't have the machine. They set us on the side of the road for like 30 minutes. I did all the field sobriety stuff. And he was like, okay, well, you're not under arrest, but I'm going to take you downtown so you can blow in the little machine. 
So when I blew in the machine, I damn near blew like a one, two, so it was like almost a 2.0 or some shit. I'm like, what? I was like, dude, this, I was like, there's no fucking way y'all saying uh, I, I did, uh, I, I drunk this much or anything like that when I had one drink. So then uh, they booked me in, I get arrested. I'm like, okay, cool. I call William Bubba Head. He's the guy who wrote the book on DUIs in the state of Georgia. So William Bubba Head, now, mind you, the team, anytime you do anything or get arrested, they treat you like you're guilty. So I had to fly to New York, David Stern, he cur- he doing all this cursing and talking again. Uh, the team pissed off at me. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm innocent. So we go down there, we figure out, that they had one of the deputies in the office calibrating that machine when it's supposed to be a certain specialist that calibrate that machine. Mm-hmm. So my overturned arrest. Um, hold on, hold on. They, one second, one second. That Was that just for you? Yeah. Or was that when any player in the league got in trouble, they had to go to David Stern's office? I don't know if it was just for me or anybody else, but every time I got in any trouble, I had to go see David Stern. Damn. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Go ahead. You said when you kept when go ahead. Yeah, so the uh William Bubba Head, uh, he came down there and had a specialist find out that the machine was hadn't been calibra- uh, calibrated right since they purchased it because they had a deputy who wasn't certified calibrating this machine. Mm-hmm. So they had to they had to release people from prison based on my conviction. Because they were giving out DUIs that were false. Damn, that's crazy. So did David Stern ever get that information? He did. He never said he he never came back and apologized. He when the Valdosta thing got thrown out, he never came back and apologized. None of that. Damn, that's crazy. Anything, I, anything I've ever been charged mm-hmm. for, I, it's it's been thrown out because it's on camera. That's crazy, bro. So now you come back the second season, you're in training camp. Are you starting at this time or what's going on? Oak is there now. So uh, Oak they, is there. Mike brings Oak in. <laughs> well, <laughs> shout out to Big Oak. I love Oak, man. Everything about Oak. We know why Mike brings Oak in there. You bring Oak in, you're trying to toughen somebody up. You're trying to get everybody, he trying to get everybody on point. And I think they draft Jared Jeffries that year, or is it? Yeah. That's right, they did. Oh, so they went and got a power four that year too, and Jared Jeffries. Yeah. So, so uh, the first day I got there, um, I, I got introduced to Jared Jeffries like this by Doug Collins. He said, "Here's the guy that's coming to take your job." Man. And what did you say, bro? I just let my actions do the talking. <laughs> now, what? What? Yeah. Now, what was your actions after that? It made me hate Jared Jeffers because he smiled. And so I tore his ass limb from limb every day in practice. He was too light in the ass. And what was Doug Collins' response to that? I would look at him every day like, this is who you bought for me? This guy was all Big Ten or whatever in Indiana. I would tore him from limb to limb. And and Mike, and oh, so who's starting right there at, at, at that time? Who's the big start? They want it. They, I guess they penciled in Jared Jeffries in the beginning, but unfortunately, Jared Jeffries, I think they would have started him just because of the fanfare. This guy went to Indiana. Um, a lot of people loved him, but he tore his knee up his first year uh, in practice. So, hold on. So, that's the only reason why. So, they, they wasn't going to start you, but they will start him as a rookie coming in. No, they had already went sour on me. The trade didn't go through. Um, and I think all of the injuries and the things like that, they were sour on me. So, but and you were still in- I was killing them in practice, it was nothing. I, it was nothing I could do. Right. So, hold on. So, and this time, um, who? so who ended up starting at that time then? They put Christian Leitner back in at the starter. So, hold on. Who started the five then? The four, the four and the five? Uh, Brendan Haywood. Okay, those are the two guys that start. So your second year when you started, you ain't even so did you even start for the Wizards? Um, I had maybe I played in like 69 games or 72 games my second year, something like that. And I may have started like 38 games. Now the games now let, let's get to that, right? So hold on. This whole time, 
tell us some stories about Oak and the practices and, and Mike and Oak and how was this stuff going down in the practices and why do you think Oak was brought in when you saw it like develop? Oak was there to toughen everybody up, uh, teach him how to work, kick your ass if you need to. He was like the team enforcer um, for the other team and for our team. Like if, if you right. ain't practicing hard, you had to deal with Oak. If you came late, you had to deal with Oak. Like he was making sure that everybody was doing what they were supposed to be doing. Man, and listen, let me tell you something about Oak, bro. One thing about Oak, once you get him mad, he willing to go all the way. Ain't yeah. no stop. Ain't no pause. Ain't no ain't no chill. Ain't no fault. No, he fitting to go. He ready to go all the way. Mm -hmm. And I think that players around the league respected and understood that about Oak. He was gonna stand mm -hmm. on whatever he believed in. Oak was gonna stand on that for real. So I know Cass wasn't wasn't bull jabbing uh, on that team behind the scenes. I know Cass wasn't playing no games. I know. Did you see situations where Oak had to get dudes straight in practice because they was they was on some bullshit? Yeah, I mean, Oak, Oak uh, he was he was more of a his teammates. He'll give you a pass as far as putting his hands on you, as long as you chill out when he cursing your ass out, but. He, it was more vocal. He was more just cussing you the fuck out. He, I ain't never really seen him hit a teammate. Right. Now, did you see – now, did Mike – you and Mike didn't have no altercations where he hitting you, punching you, doing none of this stuff? Nah. I mean, other than a couple times, they him and Oak jumped me, but they, they, they would fuck me up now. They would jump me and shit because, I was, like I said, I was always bothering them. I I'm always listen. This I this is you saying this is like playful stuff though. This wasn't no. Yeah, this is like this I'm is trying to. Me. I'm the young cat. I don't even play. I didn't even play tonk at the time. I don't even know how to. Right. Not tonk. What they playing? Uh, yeah, they playing tonk up front. I don't even know how to play this game, but I'm up there fucking with them. These all grown men got money. I'm up there. I'm grabbing the nigga money. I'm doing all kind of shit because that's just right. who I am. I like to laugh, and so you fucking with people money and all that. Hey, they go. They gonna come play back. So, but. The stories that they tell, like MJ beat me up, was slapping me, and all that. Yeah, where did all these? Where did these rumors come from, bro? Because they heard MJ curse me out one time in a um, in a gym. Like he said something in a shoot around that the media might have overheard. Like you stupid dumb motherfucker or some shit like that. But that's just normal to me. That's how he talked. That wasn't nothing different. My uncles talk like that, but it's MJ. So. It's the most egregious thing some white reporter has ever heard. Because now, was he said he said faggot motherfucker or something, but I didn't hear him say that. But now, was he? Yeah, he said that. I wouldn't give a damn. <laughs> was he? Now, was he on this? Like, as far as uh, in the locker room, the second year, and then the practices, was he? Was he? Uh, was he? Was he real hard on everybody? No, I mean, as long as you. He just came back with more rules. Like he implemented the Breakfast Club and all that, and he would judge you based on that. Judge you based on how much work you did. And if he saw you do the work, he's more friendly to you. If he didn't see it, then he wasn't really fucking with you. But yeah, his knee man. had his knee had started to swell up and give him problems. So uh, he started to see that it wasn't going to be what he thought it was going to be. And then once he saw it like that, what well, was he still in there trying to? Was he? What was his approach there? Was he still trying to go in there and go hard, or was he? You know, he couldn't. Of, he couldn't no more because every time he would go hard, his knee would swell up, and then he cut his finger, so he was try, he was healing up from that thing. Man, but David Stern probably didn't call him in the office for that, did he? Nah, MJ. He's shit. MJ a star. He's a superstar. He did what he want. Right. Like, I, I don't even know if MJ had to take the drug test. Man, that's crazy. So you guys were taking drug tests. Yeah. But you did you think hold on, but you didn't think MJ was on that. He you don't think he was on uh, no PEDs and I no, I don't think he was on that, but I just don't think he had to take drug tests. Man, you say that you're gonna go viral for saying that because they're gonna say, Oh man, we'll see. Y'all talking about LeBron James and Michael Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Man? But I, it, it, you can see it was natural, Mike going down. Like, yeah, you know, what I'm saying it wasn't nothing supernatural. He doing running over dudes, you know, what I'm saying taking off over five dudes, doing crazy stuff that you ain't never seen before. Age thirty nine, you really seen like 
the 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 wear and tear. Yeah, he couldn't uh, jump as high. He couldn't move laterally as much. So it was. But it was he, crazy how he was still going out in the game and putting up damn near twenty a night. Because he was smart, like he he knew he can get to a spot. That that comes to training. Most guys couldn't do what he did because they wasn't tra- they wasn't training like him. Everything he was able to do at that age, it wasn't raw talent. It wasn't his physical ability no more. It was just his up here. I'm just gonna outsmart you. I'm gonna get to this spot. I'm gonna. He did a lot of pump fakes where normally he would just rise up and go above you. Now, in comes Stephen A. Snitch. Mm-hmm. Now, this he's not a beat writer for you guys. He came in as a beat writer for the Philadelphia 76ers with AI. Yeah. So he's with the he's a Philadelphia 76ers beat writer, not a Wizards beat writer. Okay. Where does he get all his information and stuff that he uses as slander you as far as you know? This, that, and the third. You ain't working. You, you. He's went viral a lot of times with stuff that he said about you uh, when you got traded uh, from the Lakers for for Paul Gasol. Uh, that infamous clip. How how did you feel uh, when you heard him? That let's go to that day when you got traded uh, from the Lakers to the Memphis Grizzlies and that Paul Gasol deal. Did you see what Stephen A. Smith had said about you on TV? No. I so when did watching, you? I have stopped watching that shit. I, you have to stop when you got the world talking about you in that type of way. You just don't feed into it. I never watched, and so one day I heard it because they played it. Doug Collins, I think he put it on and played it in the locker room, and it was trying that, to be that funny. Part. Yeah, trying to be funny. He put it on in the locker room, and that was the first time I heard it. Oh, That's actually, not Doug. Crazy. Not Doug. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Not Doug, but um. Who was that? Not Chip Schaefer. Um, I heard it in the locker room. I heard it twice. I heard it in Charlotte, and I heard it uh, right when I got traded, right after I got yeah. traded in California. Now, let me ask you this question, right? Let me rewind just a little bit. So now your third year in Washington, Mike is gone. He's retired. He's out of there. Mm-hmm. Now you seem like you're starting to get a little bit of opportunity. Who's the coach then your third year? Eddie George. So when Eddie George comes in, what is your interaction with Eddie George? It was cool. It was all positive. He's he's a he's a pretty positive coach until the pressure come on. But yeah, he he was pretty cool. <laughs> what whole time? What do you mean when the pressure come on? <laughs> I mean, he seemed like he stood on morals and principles, and it don't matter who you are. You're going to stand on it. And he talked a good one. But then uh, Gilbert changed that shit for him real quick. Now, hold on. So, uh, Gil came in your third year. Yeah. So, now you're playing with you're playing with Gilbert Arenas your third year. hmm Now, what – let's get to that a little bit. What was that – what is that like, you and – um, you know what? We're going to say that for a different episode. We're going to say that one for a different episode. You know, but I, I, I want to say, you know, I want to say this. Let me go back to Stephen A. Smith. And I know y'all gonna be mad in the comments, like, man, come on, ticket, man, man. We we gonna we gonna get you, we gonna get y'all mind right. Yeah. Uh, Stephen A. Smith, man, he, I noticed something. He never talked about Adam Morrison, Christian Layton, and none of them guys who did really didn't pan out the way they're supposed to do in their careers. He never really talked about them the same way he talked about you. Why do you think that he has so much vitriol towards you and the things that he said? Why do you think he chose you to take his anger out on? Uh, because most of his rants was on guys like you, Stephon Marbury. Easy, easy targets. We we inspire other kids like us. We're from the inner, poor boys from the inner city. We're not supposed to make it to the NBA. If you look at if you look at Stefan Marbury's background and you look at his family and you look at mine, they're similar. And they're going to do away, to, in my opinion, they're going to do away with the poor boy from the inner city making it to the uh, NBA um, because it's a lot of, some of it is baggage that come with that. Um, you've seen the stories with guys from the inner city going to the league, getting in trouble. But I think they're going to go towards the, the mixed kid, the clean cut guys, and the Europeans. 
they're going to do away with this inner city, uh, make it into the NBA type of thing because we're supposed to go to prison. My trajectory when I started doing research with the brothers I had when the, or I have in, in the environment I, I grew up in, the statistics say I was supposed to go to prison. Man, that's crazy, man. So when you really found out that Stephen A was really slandering you like this, when did you, at what point in time did you see that he was really slandering you like this? And how did you feel about that? Um, I was in Charlotte. I was older. So I'm in Charlotte and I'm just like, okay, well, I just noticed it's the same narrative with the media. If you listen to every game, the announcers keep bringing up the fact that I'm a number one draft pick. It doesn't matter how I'm playing, what I'm doing. I'm playing well in the final or in the uh, playoffs for the Lakers. I'm healthy. I'm playing well. And they still bring it up. Oh, he's a number one draft pick. He didn't pan out. They just always have something negative to say. I'm averaging a double-double in two quarters in Charlotte once I got healthy. Oh, he was the number one draft pick. This, this, and that. He's a bust. And I'm like, damn, we just won the game. I, I, I got 23 and 12. Uh, why are we just not talking positive? Why we keep bringing up the number one draft pick and saying this guy's a bust. It was the same narrative. And then when I found the clip of uh, one clip of Stephen A going to the colleges, I'm like, when did this happen? And why the fuck is he going to high schools and colleges talking about an NBA play? And to me, it's always been a mystery. It's something to that. And I know it's going to stay a mystery because I don't think Disney, I don't think Stephen A., I don't think any one of them wanted to atone for what they did to a teenager. Grown men are coming up with memes and creating uh, a narrative around a person they never met. Never, I never even had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Stephen A. Smith. He don't know anything about me, but he can talk like that. It's, a, it's, a, shame. it's a shame what they actually did. That's That's, I mean... And the way he did it, bro, and the way he, you, you would think that it was, I mean, I'm beyond, it was believable the stuff he was trying to say. I mean, it was like, yo, he's like the stuff he's saying, he's trying to make it to where it's believable that everybody can think that you just didn't work hard. You didn't care. Uh, you only wanted to get a paycheck. He made it seem like that, bro. But with the stuff he was saying on TV for years, every single NBA draft, he bringing your name up, disrespecting every draft, bro. Every single draft. No, no, I've never no, seen him do that. Mind you, I'm the second fastest guy on the team. I'm the in most shape guy on the team. Uh, Five percent body fat, um, but I don't like to work. Made no sense. I'm getting the. It, it wasn't until year eight, year nine, year ten, and then people started to say, "Wait a minute, how can all of this be true?" What you guys are saying? How can a guy who's lazy, who doesn't work, who don't like to work? How do you guys keep paying him millions of dollars? How? It don't make sense. Let me ask you something. After your after those years in Washington, did you kind of lose confidence that the teams didn't have confidence in you? Did you kind of lose confidence and say, man, this shit ain't going to pan out like it should have panned out? Because I know sometimes, as me as being a basketball player, right, you never want to lose confidence in yourself, bro. Mm -hmm. But if you're going through it, if you got to deal with a certain coach or somebody like that who just fucking with you, and sometimes, like you said, like you had a coach like Doug Collins who just trying to tear you down, like you said, tear you down, tear you down, try to try to mentally break you. Right. Do you think that had a bad effect on you going forward for those years as far as like going on to the next situation? Because you're like, damn, dog, I ain't even get off. Like, you know, sometimes when you don't get off to a good start, that might affect your, your overall race. So, yeah. you know, you got to come out the blocks. Well, a lot of guys, if you come out the blocks, well, you might be all right. If you, you ain't coming out the blocks like you're supposed to, maybe because you got this coach that has something against you, you didn't have a plan, all this other stuff that was stacked against you that people didn't take into equation for you being a high school kid coming into this situation with the greatest player to ever play basketball. Mm -hmm. Bro, how did that mentally like fuck with you as far as just because your game, people would say that your game looked completely different from when you came from high school. Then when you went to the league, you weren't even using like the same moves. It's like you you just it's like man it's like you you almost just like man he dudes like this man fucked up my career going to this team yeah because Doug would always tell you what not to do 
like I used to handle the ball. And I remember the moment uh, I got the ball stolen by uh, Jason Kidd, who is one of the best all time stealers in the league. Like he stole the ball. I remember he came to the sideline. Don't you have a fucking dribble the ball again? You pass the ball out, this and that. I'm like, so I asked him, I said, well, why the fuck did you draft me? And then they find the shit out of me. So it's like, I, I got in trouble every time I said something. So I was like, fuck it, I'm just not gonna talk. So then when I, I was supposed to go to New Jersey, I kept telling my agent, I need to get to New Jersey. I want to play with Jason Kidd. I want to play with a pass first point guard. I, I, I'm only playing with people who just volume shoot the ball. And that's the first time I've been in that situation. And so once they traded me out to LA, I'm like, oh fuck. I told my agent, y'all just did the same. I'm in the same situation. And I've never been in a situation with a pass first point guard. If you look at everybody I played with, they were all shooters. Yeah, you never, it was never like, yo, let's give him the ball. Let's, let's plan around him. It was like after that second year, after that first year, you seemed like they just gave up on you pretty much. Mm -hmm. But then it seemed like you had a relight that third year when Eddie, when Eddie came, when Eddie Jordan yeah, because came. he was, he didn't judge me. It, was, it didn't feel like I had to prove myself all over again. Because in different situations, you go to another team, that fucking label that they put on you, all the shit that Stephen A said. That's it. Now, yeah, everybody's watching you to the T. Let's see if he does work. Is it? And so I had to earn everybody's respect everywhere I went because, and, it, and I had to double earn it because they're already hearing something that a stranger said, taking it as facts. So, if, if Mike hated you so much, why would he bring you back to the to the Bobcats? Mike didn't hate me. But see, that's the thing. That's the narrative that's put out there that Mike didn't like you. He hated you. He 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 tormented you in practice. He berated you every day. He didn't like you. But that, that, see, that's the part that people got to explain, big dog, that don't make sense. If that dude didn't like you so much, if he thought you was just so much of a scrub or a bum or whatever, a bust or whatever they want to say, why would he then give you more money and bring you to Charlotte? Listen, these people just like to hear themselves talk. They made an excuse for that. You're asking a very logical question. And the answer is because Mike didn't treat me like they say he did. I mean, was he a perfect person? No. I think Mike, uh, I got backlash for him not getting the trade that he wanted. So, yeah, for a time period, he was fucking with me and riding me and doing all kinds of, saying all kind of weird shit. But I come from a place where I'm not necessarily uh, affected by, that by a man yeah. talking like that. I, I've heard men talk like that, so I wouldn't really tripping off that i i think personally that mike really likes you i think i think he i think he fucked with you bro because if you're gonna bring somebody back and say yo come on back over here big dog i got a job for you yeah i that's, think it, that's, i think it was i think he brought me back kind of like he kind of felt it like damn i really did take this guy's shining moment like me coming back him winning and getting that shining moment again i had to lose and lose out on being the number one draft pick because once MJ came back, it was all about MJ. And now uh, when you, when you're in Charlotte, now Oak is the assistant coach, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what is that like with Mike running the team and Oak is the assistant coach over there? What, explain that. Cause I heard you say, cause I, now I heard you got into it before about this. Cause people were saying that Oak was whooping your ass and stuff like this. Now let, let's get, let's get to that before we get out of here. Cause I want to, I do want to touch on that too. What what is the truth about that situation in Charlotte? No, nah, Oak never touched anybody, but Oak threatened everybody. <laughs> he was about to whip everybody there. Uh he was about to fight Gerald. Uh and we had to break that up. He was about to fight Gerald in the locker room. Uh and, and Oak is the type that he's quick tempered, but a lot of the stuff he's saying is right. It's true. Uh, you know what I mean? Sometimes we was bullshitting. Sometimes you, our veteran leadership was was playing games. They were smoking black and miles in the in the parking lot and things like that. And they didn't. Oak is a no nonsense type of guy. Mm -hmm. He's saying something. He's very short with you. And so there was a time where um, he didn't think I was listening to him in a drill, and he was like, uh, "What do you say, motherfucker? Pay attention or something, something, something." And then I was like, oh, you, you don't got to talk like that, bro. Because at this time, I'm older. So I'm like, oh, you don't got to talk like that. You, We already respect you. You're a veteran. You don't got to curse us out to get us to do a drill. 
And he was like, shut the fuck up. I'll throw this ball in your face. <laughs> and, and, and I'm standing there like this. Hey, that's how Oak is, though, ain't it? Yeah. I mean, that's Oak being Oak, ain't it? And, and, he was, <laughs> and I, I'm looking at him like, are you serious? Like, he was at the free Hold on, line. time out. Time out. Time out. Time out. You talking? <laughs> Hold yeah. on, bro. You talking to him calm, like, "Hey, come on, Oak, man." You, <laughs> yeah. So you're not I, even I, screaming at him when you say that. I stay the same way all the time. No, I'm saying, so, but you not. Hold on, I want everybody to get get this. When he, no, I'm when, not screaming when at he, all. When he got you, just talking to him, like, "Oh, you don't, you don't got to do all that, bro." He was like, "Shut the fuck up!" I hit you with this goddamn ball. And I didn't move. I didn't flinch at all. I just stayed there and looked at him. And so everybody in the practice laughing like a motherfucker, right? Like like you do it. So I'm mad as a motherfucker. <laughs> I'm mad as a motherfucker, boy. Are you, are you crazy? <laughs> no, seriously. This is a true story. Everybody I say, you know. <laughs> hey, I'm mad as a motherfucker. Everybody laughing, right? So now... <laughs> Hey, listen, Rod Higgins, Rod Higgins over there laughing. Uh, MJ, little bitch boy. So he over there laughing and shit. This is supposed to be the GM. He laughing like this is funny. And so I'm looking <laughs> like, damn, I want to slap the shit out of you. And, and it's like, this is the last, this is the last, I got a one year deal and y'all playing with me like this. You got a coach acting like he want to throw a ball in my face. You got a GM over there laughing. So I'm like, boy, they want me to crash out this ball. That <laughs> nigga Oak breaking all the coach rules. <laughs> all the rules. I'm talking about if I would have got skipped with that ball, I'm going to own the goddamn facility. I'm suing the fuck out of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I know I ain't get down, bro. All the dudes in that circle, they, they move. The Oak them move the same, nigga. They ready, they ready to step to you in the locker room. They ready, they, yeah. they ready to take it there, bro. After the game, they, they come hey. there, cuss your ass out. Dare you to say something to him, man? Oak was about to fight everybody. He fight. He was gonna fight Ed Raho Nahara. He was about <laughs> to fight. <laughs> like I'm talking about for real. Nahara got mad at man. Fuck this shit. I'm not scared of you. Nahara got yeah. crazy. And then got there. Joe, Joe Prince Miller got traded from Portland uh, to the team. That white boy, they're crazy. He said, "You ain't gonna do shit to me. I don't give a fuck what you said." Oh, like that yeah. big tall white boy, Joe Prince Miller. Yeah. Yeah. They, he, he the first day he got there, they damn near got to a fight. Oh my god! Bro. And then uh, Stephen uh, Stephen Jackson, I mean he Stephen Jackson would keep talking back and forth. With, like Oak would always say, especially after a loss, he didn't want you looking at no goddamn stat sheet because that didn't teach you nothing, and he don't want you having no fun back there partying like you won the game. So he would come back there, y'all shut the fuck up. Like me, I would always have my headphones on. I'm listening to music or whatever. But Jack would always be in the back. You know, he the loudest one all the time in any room he going to. So he'd be in the back talking loud, you know, having fun because he, he, after the game is over, it's over to him. Oak wasn't like that. So they butted heads based on him being in the back making all that noise. So that shit used to be hilarious. <laughs> Oak like having somebody granddaddy sitting around there. Not playing no games, none, bro, none. And I came up around all guys that move like Oak, bro. All them dudes out around, bro, they all came up under Oak and with Oak. And so the way I've seen it, so I, I mean, I'm just like, bro, man, I know what it is. Like, bro, I'm, I'm, I'm being coached by Terry Davis. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know Terry Davis, Big Terry Davis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. TD the same way as Oak, man. You come in the gym, I'm walking in the gym. Come on, dog. What you doing, dog? Come on. Let's get it. Yeah. He waiting up there under the basket. Like, let's go, dog. Let's go. And, you know, get you in the weight room. Let's go. We got to go. Boom. Got you in it. Doing post moves. Everything you got to go dunk and finish with. Dog, every single thing, every detail. You get the screw yeah. and criticize. So during the game, cussing you out if you ain't getting rebounds and boxing out. Every possession. Yeah. All cat. See, I already know, bro. So but that shit make you better. That shit made me a pro, bro. So I yeah. already know, like, when people say this shit about you, bro, they don't understand that shit, bro. Like, real yeah. niggas like yourself, bro, we like that type shit, real talk. Mm -hmm. Because that's the shit that's going to push us to make us better, bro. And that's yeah. the thing. That's why I feel like this, bro. And we, as we get ready to close out, I feel like that's what the league missing, bro. Yeah, They missing. I think every team should have a coach like Charles Oakley on the roster, bro. 
if he that way, just, a lot of this shit will be cleaned up, bro. Back a little bit of the violence because the, the corporate, the, the corporate was like, okay, if he actually do hit one of these kids, then, then right. well, these players, then what? So that's right. the only thing with him. If he can dial back that and just from a workout standpoint, like he got me back in shape. Like mm -hmm. I fucked up my ankle. They gave me one of Tyson Chandler's 16s and uh, he had had turf toe before. So they, they like, they did something to the shoe. They did something to the big toe area. So my foot like popped all the way over in the damn mm. shoe. So I'm like, fuck, I did, I done got my ankle reconstructed a couple years ago. And, you, and now I done popped my fucking foot because y'all give me somebody else's shoe. And so, you know, I had to wait, get healthy. I, I, if you look, when I first got to Charlotte, I was big. Then I lost, I got back down to 271. I was getting a double-double in two quarters. But dog, I, I I believe some of these cats need to get their ass whooped on the locker room, bro. I, I'm just, I'm telling you, bro. I'm, I'm be honest with you, bro. Bro, I'm a hundred percent for Oak style, bro. Because yeah. I think that the league need more discipline like that, bro. You'll have more. You'll have a better quality of play. Guys playing harder. Guys playing smarter. You understand what I'm saying? Guys being in more shape. Guys being more disciplined. Like, like I look at a dude like Zion Williamson. If Oak was assistant I coach on his team, none of this shit. None of, and see, people don't understand yeah. that, Kwame. The league, yeah. uh, any team that's watching this in the league, bro, y'all need to call that dude to call dudes like him, bro, because y'all yeah. need guys like that. Y'all wondering why these dudes running around here acting a damn fool, doing whatever they want to do, not disciplined, not going hard, stealing your money. You understand what I'm saying? And not giving you the product that you they need to be putting on the court. It's because you don't got those type of dudes on the, on, on the staff. Now you got all these computer nerds, computer geeks. Big 200, 300, 400, 10 ton pound off sitting on the sideline, don't know nothing about basketball, bro. Get them clowns out of and get these real guys back in there. Yep. Get these Udonis Haslam's on the sidelines. Get these Charles Oakley's on the sidelines. Go get them enforcers that was under in the league for get them dudes on the sidelines, bro. And that way you can control and you can police some of this stuff. And now you have a better product, bro. Guys yep. need that. They don't want to work no more, Kwame. They don't want to practice no more, bro. Nope. They don't, they, now all you hear about teams don't even want to practice, bro. Come on, bro. What, what, what? Imagine you telling Charles Oakley, man, I don't want to practice today. Man, you crazy as hell. Yeah. <laughs> Oak would have had Zion ass in shape, boy, because he'd have been up that, in his face every single day. Save his career. Yeah. And, may, and listen, when I say save his career, y'all, I'm talking about the money he going to make in the future. Yeah. See, he jumping. Y'all like don't it, understand this. It's going to be worth it. He jumping. And money now for the future because if he ain't in shape in three years, he not gonna get the type of money he could get. This dude by the end of his career, he could have got a million dollars playing basketball. But yeah. just because he's not gonna be in shape, just because he don't have that discipline and them dudes in them organizations ain't really pushing them the way they're supposed to be pushing you, because you're really supposed to be pushing yourself. But you need to be having dudes in there that's really doing that, bro. Bro, that's that's why I asked you the other day. I was like, yo, you are you trying to get back in? Because, bro, they need guys like that, bro. I'm trying to tell you, man, they don't have this no more, bro. I can see I can see it by how these dudes is playing, bro. Yeah, I got some young cats I'm going to start working with. But they are they on the high school, eighth grade, ninth grade level. Um, I like it when it's like that. They're eager to learn. Um, these Some of these cats, man, the, these dudes, I don't understand. I don't even understand how they play at the weight that they play at. Like, we had target weights that they would come in. And we had body fat. They would check your body fat. I wonder what some of these guys' body fat is. That's you know, these top players. Like what? Are, what are their body fat? What? Are, what are they doing? Come on, dog. Now these Come niggas sipping lean and hooping or something. I don't get it. Come on, dog. That that would that's what's going on. But hey, dog. I'm tell you something, bro. And then, and this is the last thing I'm gonna say before we shut this down. You, I hope you come back to doing like this on your channel, bro. Because I'm gonna tell you something, man. You, I wouldn't even care about the haters, bro. Cause I, it's thousands of people make videos, but I don't care about none of them. They niggas ain't control nothing in my life. I hope, cause I see, I noticed that you have, like, I just want to see you be be who you are and not worry about them niggas like you was when you came on kicking these niggas draws in their ass. Mm. Period. Because that's what they need. The streets need that, man. And I wouldn't. I hope, man. I don't, I wouldn't give a damn about shit about what none of these whole ass niggas say, man. Because at the end of the day, bro, they ain't been through what you've been through. They ain't lived your life. And a lot of these people that talk shit, bro, they got shit going on. Everybody got their own shit going on in their life. Mm -hmm. So at the end at the end of the day, man, this is a great episode right here that we did, man. And again, man, I know a lot of people want to see you 
in this mode again, man, when you're doing what you're doing, man, I, I hope and pray that you come back to that, man, because that was that's legendary, bro. When you in that type mode, man. When you in that type mode, man, and you got you had you know Judge Joe Brown, all the people you got coming up, man. The things you cooking on, man. Don't never let none of these people discourage you, man. Because I, you a big dog, and all these people eye. Because if you wasn't, they wouldn't be fucking with you. Right. If you if you was a nobody, they wouldn't care about what you got going on. Mm hmm. Shit, because the, the 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 average man, Kwame, they ain't got shit going on. They ain't fucking with him. They ain't worried about him. Right. See, I'm trying to distract them because I got some things I'm hiding that I got going on in my personal life that I'm trying to get done because everything that I try to do, it seems like somebody behind the scenes is trying to uh, try to stop it from happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, maybe I said a little too much one or two times on my main channel. So I've been kind of avoiding that channel last year, but I'm about to start getting back on that channel because I kind of see what I need to be talking about is definitely not these clowns. So. Yeah, man, because we get, hey, bro, we getting to it, man. Them niggas ain't yeah. even, bro. I, like I said, man, like, bro, man, you, 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 you a big dog in this shit, man. Like I said, you was the original who came on YouTube and broke the internet. Ain't nobody broke that shit like you broke it, bro. And so that you see what they're doing with Shane. I know you probably gonna talk about this now. When yeah. The story that came out. So, but you see what they're doing with Shay Sharp now that he don't did the interview and that shit broke the web. So, like I said, man, and this is what happens. We we talked about it. It's a lot of people gonna show love, but then you always know how the, the hate gonna come from so, from so, so many places, man. Because mm -hmm. so many people don't want to see you doing your thing, so they're trying to attack you and come at you, man. But bro, man, the, the next time we come in, we going we gonna go. Ooh, y'all, y'all better get ripped, man. Don't y'all know, man, that this man played a damn near decade in the league, bro. Don't y'all understand, man, the knowledge and the understanding that this guy have to pull on everybody and, the, and it's doing numbers. Everybody's seeing this. Y'all all seeing it. So, again, Kwame Brown bust life. Y'all go subscribe to his channel. Back in the algorithm. Doing big things. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yep. And, we put, and, we, and, and we out here getting it and we out here pushing it to the limit. And we want to see it. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. The stories that he's giving you guys and sharing with you is to help the next person along, whether you in high school, middle school coming up, college, or the pros. These are lessons. These are life lessons that's helping everybody grow and be better men. And y'all learning from the bullshit that he had to deal with with punk ass niggas like Stephen A. Snitch that mm -hmm. would try to tear a man down, go to colleges and talk shit about a man that he didn't even know he did. He wasn't even a beat writer and covered the man. Mm hmm. So this is the type of stuff that we that we that we promote, and we don't have and we don't need them niggas to to do what we got to do. See, they he think we need them. No, we don't need you. We can we can shine and do our thing without them niggas. So shout mm -hmm. out to you, my brother. Shout out to you, man. And in closing, I'll say this, man, for for the young cats, just stay on your square, man. I I knew I was being treated wrong. I knew some of the ways I was being spoken to was wrong, and I stood on it. And so a lot of people say, "Oh, you get in your own way," but no. Nah, I'm not going to be treated a certain way that I'm not comfortable with. And a lot of people don't speak up. I didn't speak up in the public eye because I knew you're dealing with a different beast. They they love MJ. There's fanatics over MJ. So anything a guy who wasn't playing, uh, you, you're the number one draft pick. You're not playing. You're injured a lot. And you're talking against the the most iconic figure in sports. Uh, nah, that's not that dog ain't going to hunt. So. Um, but for the most part, I said what I could say, and for the rest, I just ate it and stood like a man, ten toes down. Man, and shout out to Michael Jordan, man. Shout out to Jordan, man, because he did. He came back and gave you a job, bro. When the exactly. brother come back and give you a job, man, that all that other shit, people talking, that's out the window, bro. Exactly. He thought he thought enough of you. The greatest player yeah. to ever play the game of basketball thought enough of you. Mm -hmm. So all that shit that, that Stephen A. Smith and them punk ass dudes, some man, listen, bro. The, the, the man himself went and came back and got this man and gave him a job. So what y'all saying? Man, Yo, them, man, them people don't know shit. <laughs> come on, bro. We gonna, hey, we're gonna we gonna get back to it. We're gonna keep exposing the bullshit, man. So salute to you, brother. I appreciate you, man. And um, y'all go subscribe to his channel, Kwame Brown Bus Life. I'm gonna put the link in the comment section, pin at the top. Y'all already know what it is. If y'all ain't already subscribed to him, and let's All get right. it, man. We're gonna 2024, man. We're gonna take this thing over, y'all. Y'all know what it is. Salute to you, salute to the chat.
All right, dog. No doubt, man. I'm out, bro. Peace, y'all. Salute to everybody. Y'all hit the like, share, subscribe. Y'all know what it is, man. Shout out to Kwame Brown, man. And y'all already know how I'm doing, man. And salute to anybody who donated to the stream, supported the stream. I appreciate y'all. Y'all know what it is, man. And on the next time we come back, we're going to have some more heat for y'all, man.